Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible lesson. Let's, uh, let's begin with a prayer. Our God, as we start a new book today, we pray that you will give us insight and understanding that we may grasp the concepts that you have shared with us in your word. We're thankful for the opportunity to study. We're thankful for the opportunity to live a life that is in accordance with the will of our God. Forgive us when we fail short and fall short of your expectations. Love us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned in the prayer, we're going to be starting a, a new book today, uh, Second Timothy. Uh, just to kind of give a little bit of insight on on uh, on the two letters. If you go to the very end of the book of Acts, uh, the book of Acts ends with Paul in prison. Uh, he had made some statements earlier in the book that he had a desire to go to Spain. Scriptures don't ever reveal that. However, tradition and ancient writers uh, all indicate that that was the case. So the, here's the way that this thing kind of typically works out as, as we understand it, again, through tradition and ancient writings. Paul would get out of prison at that point, and then a few short years later he would be rearrested now most likely this was in accordance with the the event that happened in rome about 64 a.d where nero started a fire that burned the entire city of rome now he needed a scapegoat and so he began to blame christians and take christians and expose them to all manner of of persecution and uh painful deaths uh and the idea, that, or the 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 the, the, uh, the teaching that we get from the ancient writings is, is that the apostle Paul was rearrested and was subsequently uh, executed. Uh, most of the theologians feel like that the book of Second Timothy happened at the at the uh, during that second arrest, that second imprisonment in Rome, and just prior to him being executed. Now. Uh, whether that was weeks or months, we really don't know. But but with with, with Second Timothy, it is it is clearly a much more nostalgic book, a much more a, a much more sentimental book. Uh, there's things in it which which I, I think if if it, in our modern vernacular, if we had a person that was on on death row, uh, awaiting execution. You would you would hear these things from them the, the, these concepts of of talking about life and talking about the hereafter and the eternal and and we're going to hear all that uh, and it will get more prevalent as we go through the book. Uh, it's a it's a very it's a very emotional book. You you can you can you can feel as as Paul is writing to his closest confidant his his. Uh, one of his closest friends, the person who he probably feels will will take his place in Christianity, uh, and it is it is very emotional uh, as as Paul works through this book. Uh, so that all having been said, uh, let's begin to work through Second Timothy. Second Timothy, of course, is the although chronologically in in the in the writings in the New Testament, it kind of falls toward the end. It is actually the final letter that we have that is recorded by the Apostle Paul uh, in all of his writings. So this is the last letter. Uh, and, and it is going to have, again, some things that are very very sentimental and very uh, uh, very nostalgic uh, in, in, as Paul comes toward the end of his life. So let's pick up in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God according to the promise of life in Jesus Christ. The promise of life. Uh, you know, that, to me that is, a, that is a passage that is, 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 one, is one who is, <coughs> pardon me, who is contemplating his own physical death, uh, his own execution. He falls back to the point that the life that Jesus gives us and the life that Jesus promises us is not something in this world, but the next. It is, it is life eternal. And, and as you read it from that perspective, as you get in there, according to the promise of life in Jesus Christ, that's really the essence of why we follow Jesus, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's the essence of why we, we commit our lives to Him, not for what we get now. Although there certainly is contentment and peace and, 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 and an array of, of, of things which makes our life fuller and makes our life more, more enjoyable in this life, 
it is it is the next life that we are really excited about and that we are really focused on the eternal life and, and I think that's what I think that's what Paul is saying here so he very much uh, he very much uh, begins the book with this idea of kind of looking forward to the the next the next uh, uh, life that is is after this one uh, then verse two he says to Timothy and again you think about a you think about a scroll that is written when we write a letter today, we, we write it to dear whomever we're writing it to. We write the body of our letter, and then we sign it at the end. On a scroll, they would always sign it at the very beginning, so that when you first open the scroll, you would know who actually wrote this. So it is Paul saying, this is from Paul, and then it directly follows with who it's to. To Timothy, my beloved son. And that's a spiritual son he's talking about there, who he would have converted back on his second missionary journey. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from the God, from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the de facto standard introduction that Paul almost always makes. Almost every one of his letters always have some reference to, to grace and, and peace and mercy because Paul never throughout his entire life from the time he became a Christian until he died forgot that when he was on the road to Damascus to persecute the church to, to, to kill Christians if need be that was when Jesus made his appearance to him and that's when he received his salvation that's when he received the hope that followed Paul never forgot that and I love that about his his persona about how he he, he never became bigger or, or felt like he was bigger than he was. He was always just this sinner who was going to persecute Christians when Christ came and offered him salvation. Uh, such a wonderful, such a wonderful. And this is in verse 2 is, is actually virtually identical to the way that he introduced the, the, uh, uh, the, the first letter, 1 Timothy, uh, early in that letter. So I won't spend a lot of time there. I thank God whom, verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. Now, I love the reference there to forefathers. Uh, Paul's forefathers, when he was Saul, would have been Jews. They would have been followers of Jehovah God. And they did it with, based on what he's saying here, they were, they were, very, they were very focused. They were very dedicated. They were, they were clearly trying to do what God had expected. And with the same passion, the same zeal, Paul now performs his same service to our God as a Christian. Uh, but he says, I'm, I'm doing as a Christian the same thing that my, that my forefathers did to J the same God, same Jehovah God, but in a state before Christ came. And, and I love that. I mean, that, that's, that's, again, that's Paul trying to, to, to bury soul, to, to give insight about why he does what he does and... and where that passion comes from, it comes from his forefathers. And he does what he does now as a Christian, the same as they did to Jehovah God under the old law. Uh, really a, really a, a beautiful insight to the, to the great apostle. And then he kind of gets a little bit uh, sentimental regarding his, his relationship and friendship with, with this young Timothy, where he says, as I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night, Paul's prayer life must have been exceptional. Uh, Virtually every book that he written, he that he wrote, every letter that he wrote to individuals, to churches, to groups of churches, he, he's constantly making reference to how he's remembering them in his prayer. And this one, the personal letter to to young Timothy, his protege, uh, that he's constantly thinking of him. Now, now remember, uh, if if you, if you studied First Timothy lately, Paul had sent. Timothy to Ephesus where there was some problems to deal with those problems and the first letter was written specifically to give Timothy insight on dealing with those problems but this one while he's still at Ephesus is written on much more of a personal kind of kind of a you, you might even say it's a uh, uh, a last will and testament uh, you might say type approach uh, toward something that, that you would write toward the end of your life and certainly Paul was at this point. He constantly remembers him in his prayers, longing to see you as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. Now, the last time they saw each other, we really don't know. Uh, it could have been prior to Paul sending him to Ephesus. It could have been after his first release from prison. Most of the commentators and, 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 and theologians 
feel like Paul from Rome went on to Spain, so he may not have gotten to Ephesus. We just don't know. But the last time they were together, it was it was an emotional setting where where there was tears shed. Paul still remembers that, and, and when he remembers that setting, it's very positive in his life. And, and listen to the way the way he ends that. Even even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. So that that was the that was the memory that Paul had of of the last time he and Timothy were together, the tears that accompanied their their separation, knowing that it might be the last time they ever see each other in this life. Uh, and and Paul remembers that with with fondness and uh, with joy, as he says. And he continues on, longing to see you. Or continues on in verse five. For I am mindful, and as he's thinking about that, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. I mean, clearly it is because because of Paul's relationship and his confidence that he had in this young protege, this young deputy whom he had dispatched in to, to represent him in, in Ephesus. But I love the fact that that Paul is kind of is kind of encouraging Timothy. You're a third generation Christian. Your grandmother was a Christian. Your mother was a Christian, and now you're a Christian. And, and I see in you that same passion that I saw in your grandmother and your mother. And that has to be encouraging to to young Timothy that that Paul would that Paul would make that association with with uh, with two people that he certainly loved. For this reason. Verse 6, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, a couple things on that. One, the laying on of his hands. That is the that is the methodology by which Paul would have imparted the Holy Spirit extraordinary to young Timothy. It is our understanding as modern day Christians that the apostles could lay their hands on someone and pass the gift extraordinary to that person where they would be able to perform miraculous miraculous healings, uh, just a, a variety of miraculous things that are, that are mentioned specifically in the book of Acts. But there is no record anywhere that the person with whom they had touched could then pass it on to someone else or continue to propagate that. In fact, when, when you study the story of Cornelius, they had to wait until, until Peter and John came, apostles, in order to lay their hands on them uh, to, to actually impart the gift extraordinary. So, this is the place where we understand and learn that Timothy had the gift and it was given to him by the laying on of hands by Paul. Uh, so, very important verse. But I love the earlier part of the scripture. You know, in, in days when I was younger, we used to do a lot of camping. We used to do a lot of things. And, and one of the things that we would, we would often do would be to build a fire. And either when we went to sleep at night or later after the fire had been burning, that fire would dwindle down to where it was just ashes and, and you could see it was about to go out. And, and we would go out and get some more sticks and put them on the fire and blow on it and stir it a little bit and it would, it would reignite. And that's the idea that I think Paul's trying to give here rekindle the fire that's in you. Re rekindle, just like you do a campfire, the, the, you rekindle the spirit through, through study and through meditation and through prayer and through focus of your life to, to, to reignite the fire, the passion that's in here. And I, th and I think that's what he's saying. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Uh, powerful piece of scripture there. Verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, or a power and love and discipline. And that's kind of setting the, the, the tone for what is coming. Uh, we're going to find out in, in the subsequent verses, we won't probably get to that today, that there had been those who had kind of through through fear and intimidation of the Romans, through fear and intimidation of Nero specifically, as he was the prisoner of of uh, of the Roman Empire of Nero, they had kind of cowered and and kind of and kind of stepped away from Paul and stepped away from supporting him. Paul is saying, "Don't do that. Stay stay faithful and and continue." And, and that's what he says. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. And, and he takes that to the next step in, in, in verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Now, 
couple things about that particular piece of scripture. One, the, what, it, what he's talking about there when he says, ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, that's the gospel. That's, that's the story of Jesus. Don't be ashamed to share that. And also, don't be ashamed of me. Paul's talking about himself there. And, and I like the way that Paul says, his, H, capital, capital H, talking about Jesus' prisoner, God's prisoner, not a prisoner of the Roman Empire, not the prisoner of Nero. And, and I love the, Paul, the way Paul looks at that. He, everything he did in life, no matter how it turned out, it was for the glory of God. Even if he was placed in prison, he wasn't placed in prison for the purposes of the Romans. He was placed in prison to serve God for the purposes of God. And I, I, love, how he, I love how Paul gets perspective and puts perspective on that for us when we are struggling. We are asked to do things which are challenging. We do it for the glory of our God, not for ourselves and not for others. It's for God's sake. And, and that's his testimony of our Lord or of me, his, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. I mean, Paul is saying, what I'm going through right now is difficult. It's challenging. I'm going to be executed. If that's what you're, is, is, is going to happen to you, join with me in, 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 in embracing it so that God may be glorified even more. Uh, such an encouraging piece of scripture for, for Timothy and for us 2,000 years later. And every Christian that's ever lived, no matter what we're going through, we know how difficult it is. We do it for the glory of God. We do not do it for any other reason. We do it so that He may be glorified. And, and this is one of those important passages that gives us insight because that's the way Paul thought, that's the way Christ thought, and that's the way God, what God expected. Uh, beautiful piece of Scripture. According to the power of God, verse 9, talking about God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Everything that we are, are, are receiving from God is not a result of anything I've done. It's a result of what God has given me through His grace, through His mercy, through His love for me. A, a beautiful piece of Scripture. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own promise and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. There, there's a temptation to think, okay, God saw mankind sin. God saw mankind separate himself. He had to come up with a way to redeem us so he sent his son. It's important for us to appreciate as Christians the plan to redeem mankind was put in place prior to the creation of the earth, prior to the creation of man certainly. It has been a part of God's eternal plan. He understood what was going to happen. He understood the power of sin, the power of temptation, and he knew there had to be some, some mechanism to bring us back into a relationship with him when sin separated us. And this is one of those passages that we go to, to look at to appreciate that and understand that, that this wasn't a knee-jerk reaction that God had. So, well, man sin. now we've got to figure out how to, to get him back. In God's infinite, all-knowing mind, He knew before He ever created us that this would take place. And He began from literally from the time of Adam to begin to put in place prophecies and the, the, the people and a methodology to bring forth a Savior, to bring forth a Messiah, to bring forth a Redeemer, someone that could be the perfect sacrifice for sin and allow all of mankind for all of time the opportunity to reestablish a relationship with the Father. This is one of those important passages that, that we get that. Again, I'm, going to, I'm reading, beginning in the middle of verse 9. Such an important piece of Scripture, but according to His own, His is God, His own purpose and grace, which was granted to us, it was given to us, it, it, was, it was a free gift, it was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a plan before the earth was created to redeem us. And that, to, to me, that's just, it's just extraordinary to think about and, and, and try to understand and grasp the mind of our God. Continues on, But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus. And I, I like the word appearing. You know, when, when I think of myself, 
I, I have a start date. <laughs> the date that I was born was the date that I came into this world, and that is my that is my date of birth. I have no history before that. I, I have no. I, I have, there, there's nothing about me before that. Jesus is not like that. Although he came to earth and was born of a woman and lived a life like us, he existed prior to the creation of the world, prior to the creation of mankind. And, and Paul didn't just say it was given to us in Christ Jesus at his birth. Listen to what he says, because this is important. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus. So yes, Jesus did come into the world and He was born of a virgin and He grew up and He became a man. And after that, we saw His, we saw his, his years where he, was, where he was the Savior and the Messiah and all those teachings, all of that. But that wasn't His start date when He was born of Mary. His start date is eternal. It's eternity of time backwards, not not time forward like we always think of eternity. He, 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 like God, is, will be, and always was. And, and I love the selection of the word here by Paul, revealed by the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And again, think of a man who is standing condemned. Think of a man who knows his, his, his death through execution is impending. Most of us just can, can fear nothing except my life is coming to an end here on this earth. Paul understands that when he talks about, talking about Jesus. He abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We live the way we live for the purpose of eternity, for the purpose of when I die, I have the opportunity to spend time beyond time with my God, with my Savior, with those that I love, with the church. But again, it's such a danger for the carnal man, the mortal man, to think, the end is near. Uh, the, the, the end of life as, as we now know it is, 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 is imminent. And, and that's where it was for Paul. But even in that, he could see past that. He could see what I'm doing now is irrelevant in the scope of, of the, the time that I will be with my God for eternity. And this, this, is, this is just such a wonderful piece of Scripture when he's talking about what Jesus really did. He didn't come to do anything on this world but save and forgive our sins. And that's the essence of our Savior. That's the essence of the Messiah. That's the essence of the eternal plan that God had. And Paul lays it out here as beautifully as there is, it could be done. Abolish death. The grave is nothing. Abolish death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This book that we have, the New Testament, is eternal. And that's, that, is, that is power beyond what any person can do to us in this life. If, if they take this life, so be it. If, if, they, if they remove everything that we have, then we have everything we own and everything that we possess, that we have such great pride and we've worked so hard for it, so be it. Because no matter what happens, they cannot take away eternity and the salvation that we have. And, and this is as powerful of passages as you will ever find in, in Scripture about what Jesus really came for. Such a powerful. Let me, I want to read that again. But now has been revealed by the appearing of the Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That, that is the essence of why we are Christians, and the essence of why Jesus Christ came and died. Uh, such, such a powerful piece of Scripture. I'm going to stop there. We'll pick up in verse 11 next week because it... Now, let me finish it. Let me read, read verse 11 because it's, it's, Paul, it's Paul kind of saying, what, and it was for that purpose, what I just finished talking about, that I, that I do what I do. And he says, For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, and a teacher. I mean, Paul is saying, the reason that I became the great apostle to the Gentiles was because Jesus gave us the opportunity to live forever, eternally, 
Im immortality with our God. And Paul is saying, that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm a preacher. That's why I'm an apostle. That's why I'm a teacher. And it, it's, it's, it's a great tale. So we'll pick up in verse 12 next week uh, as we continue on with this great, uh, uh, I guess you would say, the, the, final, the final story that the great apostle uh, would tell us uh, before, his, before his death. Uh, so let's, uh, let's close with a prayer. Our God, we're so very thankful for your love. We're so very grateful for Jesus who was willing to submit to your eternal plan to come and live a life, to subject himself to, to torment and misery and temptation, the same as we face, yet remain perfect. And because of that, he brought us hope. He brought us immortality and an expectation of an eternal life with our God. And for this, we're so very thankful. Bless our study, and may what we discern here be appropriate. Forgive us when we fail you. Love us, we ask. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.